War is a little bit of a proving ground for humanity. Right, every war that any given society goes through, right? Well, those wars, they change that society for better or worse. Most of the time, for the worse. And for ancient Rome, there was a few wars that took place after Rome had won some key territories from Carthage that really shaped its future. And these are wars that I don't often hear talked about on other podcasts. And they're not famous wars, historically speaking, right? It's not the, uh, the, you know, it's not Sulla's March on Rome. And it's not uh, (laughs) the battles of Alexander or anything. These are wars that you may not have heard of. And yet they involve some of the most famous names in Roman history. And these wars are going to shape not only the Republic and the Iberian Peninsula, but it's going to shape Rome's response to other threats in the future, in our past and their future. So we're going to talk about the Celtiberian Wars over the next three episodes. And in particular today, we're going to talk about the lead up and the first Celtiberian War, which contains lots of stories of slaughter and betrayal. So that's where we're going today on courage and conflict. Even if you are not a historian or a history nerd, like myself, then you've probably heard of the Punic Wars. And if you haven't, let me give you a very basic, basic rundown. The Punic Wars were a trio of conflicts that took place between Rome and uh, a city called Carthage, which began as a Phoenician colony, but grew into the equivalent of a world power at the time. It was a major player on the Mediterranean stage. It maintained a vast trade network. Carthage was a sophisticated uh, power at the time. And before Rome had put on its boots, so to speak, Carthage had a foothold around the Mediterranean. The conflict that erupted between them... Uh, You know, I I could go on and on and on about the Punic Wars, but we're not here to talk about the Punic Wars today. So, a couple of things you need to understand is just that the Punic Wars were a major defining moment in Rome's history. Of course, you've probably heard the story of Hannibal crossing the Alps, etc., etc. The point is that the Punic Wars were what catapulted Rome into... Its, its own world power status, right? You might say that the Romans stepped over the course of Carthage to gain its own glory, you know, to take its place amongst the powers that existed around the Mediterranean at the time, which was to, you know, the in, in the ancient world, it was most of the world there, if you don't count China, but there wasn't much contact between the two um, areas at that time. So for Rome, Carthage was the big bad for a long time. And during the Second Punic War, Rome gained a couple of provinces from Carthage where they had set up colonies. And this was the Iberian Peninsula where, you know, Spain and Portugal are today. Now, the Iberian Peninsula, it it was rich with natural resources. They had minerals, if I'm not mistaken. 
and they had a vast population of people who had been there probably since the, you know, it's probably since the Ice Age. I mean, who knows? You know, I, I'm sure someone knows, but not me. But they'd been there a long, long time. So I don't want you to think in your head that the people who lived in this region were barbarians who were, you know, running around in furs and carrying crude swords until the Romans showed up and brought them culture, or even the Carthaginians. There had been Greek colonies there for many years, and, and, and the Celts and the Iberians and the Celtiberians who were sort of living between them, they had their own culture. There were influences from North Africa in the area. There was Greek, there, there were Greek influences, like I said. There was trade that came to the Iberian Peninsula from all over the Mediterranean. So this was a heavily populated and a sophisticated area at the time. In other words, these were valuable provinces that Rome had gained from Carthage during the Second Punic War, right? And of course, the people who lived there, you know, these people were colonized. You know, the the people like the Celts and the Iberians and the Celtiberians, like I said, if you want to divide the region into major groups, you could say, you could categorize them into these groups. But of course, they had their own subdivisions. The, the, the area was populated you know, by petty kings who ruled small kingdoms and, 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 and communities of people who had entirely different systems of governing themselves. And of course, they never consented to being, you know, ruled by Carthage probably in the first place and never consented to Rome, certainly. And the wars that would erupt in this region would last a very long time. And they would help define the figures who would go on to shape the future of Rome. And there are so many stories in the Celtiberian Wars that I just don't have time to tell them all. I've got to gloss over a lot of things. But I encourage you to go out and read about it or, you know, look up another podcast about it. If you have the time, because... It's not a period of Roman history that is often talked about. But for me, it is one of the most interesting. So the Romans move into the Iberian Peninsula. And they set up shop in two major provinces. One called Hispania Citerior, and the other called Hispania Ulterior. And basically, that meant nearer Spain and farther Spain. Or, as I like to think of them, Little Brother Spain and Big Brother Spain. Now, nearer Spain had more of a Greek influence, uh, basically speaking because there had been Greek colonies there and there had been trade from uh, Greek colonies and you know there had been Greeks in, in southern Italy and, and all, all, all over that area for a long time. And in the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula, that was farther Spain. And the, there, the influence was heavily Carthaginian. And now Rome gained control of these two provinces from Carthage during the Second Punic War. And it wasn't long until the local people there began to rebel. And there were a lot of battles that I'm going to gloss over, but I don't want you to think that these were small village raids or something like that. There were battles that involved... There was one battle where the Celtiberians raised 20,000 men, and there were two Praetorian armies that were defeated. I mean, this region slowly cooked for a long time at war. You you might say that. Now, uh, leading up to the first Celtiberian War, like I said, there were a series of conflicts. And part of the reason is that the, the Senate didn't pay much attention to what happened in these far provinces. Rome, at the time, it was a... It it was new to its power. 
so to speak, before the Second Punic War, Rome was mostly a regional power. It exerted its influence, uh, you know, in the Italian peninsula, and, you know, that, that was mostly it. But when it defeated Carthage, it gained control of a lot of its territories, and this was one of them. And the Senate wasn't used to dealing with all this new land and, and territory to administer. Rome's system of government was sort of like this uh, client uh, and, and patron relationship where, you know, people would go to senators and, you know, get favors for them. And in return, the senators would give them like a pittance of gold and, you know, they'd count on their vote or something like that. So it was a system of government that was kind of designed to work for, like I said, a, a regional, a, a small city-state, you might say. And all of a sudden, they had control of this vast territory. And there were hiccups, <laughs> you might say hiccups, in the way these provinces were administered. Now, there was a class in Rome called the equestrian class, and these were like the businessmen of Rome. The three, you know, there, there, the three major classes of Rome were the optimates, and these were like the nobility. They, they, were, they were senators. They were important families with, you know, storied names and, and great histories. They probably grew up with ancestor walls where they could trace their lineage back to some, you know, ancestor who'd done something awesome for Rome. And then there were the equestrians, and the equestrians were like the knights. It, you know, if they went to fight in the legions, they would have been mounted, and they would have had really expensive equipment because they could afford the nice armor. And they were, you know, businessmen and tradesmen and, and stuff like that. A lot of time, these equestrians would start companies, and would, you know, basically they would raise small armies, and. They would compete for government contracts to go and collect taxes from the provinces. And this was basically just, yeah, you know, go and collect this much in, you know, in resources. And whatever you get on top of that, you get to keep. So these were, you know, companies of mercenaries who were basically given leave to go and loot from the provinces and the people who lived there. So you can imagine what sort of response this engendered in the local populace. This is the very thing that breeds the seeds of rebellion. So this went on for, I want to say, about 90 years or so before the outbreak of what people call the First Celtiberian Wars, or the First Celtiberian War. And there was two major Celtiberian wars, and then there was the Numantine War, which centered around the city of Numantia, which was a major city in the region. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. First, I want to just instill in you the idea, give you an idea of what this region was like at the time. It was a colonized people who had risen up to defend themselves against the Roman oppressors. And, you know, I, I hate to couch the conflict in those simplistic terms because it was more complicated than that. But that was definitely an element to the story. And what you need to understand, uh, what I said about the area slowly cooking for about 90 years before the first Celtiberian War... It's, it's, I don't want you to think that there are clear divisions between these conflicts. This, this is just the way people have organized them in, in, in books and in history texts. The, the biggest defining thing that I can find about the first Celtiberian War that people say is that people denote its beginning when the Celtiberians raised an army of about 35,000 people to defend their territory against uh, Quintus Fulvius Flaccus who was showing up with, with an army so this the first Celtiberian war it starts with a battle for the city of Edura 
and this is a huge battle. All right, there there are like the the Romans win, they capture the city, and twenty three thousand, I think it is, twenty three thousand Celtiberians are killed in that battle. Right, and so uh, Flaccus continues to sort of ravage the countryside, and he he marches further into the territory. And there's another battle where the the Romans show up at this city, and before the defenders are alerted and 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 can come to the city's aid, it surrenders to the Romans. And as the Romans are leaving the city, they sort of stumble upon the army gathered there, and you know, fall upon them and, and, and kill them. And in that battle, it, it's something like 15 or, or, or 16,000 more Celtiberians are killed. And then Flaccus continues to march into the countryside. And there's another battle where he's ambushed when he is getting ready to hand over command of his legions to a, a very famous figure in Roman history, a top. Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, who was the father of the Tiberius Gracchus, who's so famous for getting killed by the Senate. <laughs> so, Flaccus is ambushed by the Celtiberians as he's marching back, I think, to, you know, to turn over command. And in that battle, another 20,000 or so Celtiberians are killed. So, just imagine the numbers, the losses of the local people there. You know, the Romans are, you know, marching through the countryside, ravaging the people, taking what they want. So, what choices did the local populace have? They could allow the same thing to happen when the Carpatani, you know, these equestrians who who came into the countryside to collect taxes, they were doing basically the same thing. Or they could face the legions, who were even worse. And this is, you know, the 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 the, you know, the Roman total war. This is war the way the Romans did it. So, you know, the people who were captured were were probably sold into slavery. You know, when they they, they came and they took everything that you owned and. You know, a, a big part of the wealth and the spoils for war at the time were slaves. So, if you didn't die in the battle, if you were captured, you know, who, who knows what fate awaited you at the hands of your, uh, of your Roman masters. So you can sympathize with the, the Celtiberians who lived in the area and had to deal with this new Roman boot on their throats. In 179 BC, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus marches into Celtiberia. All right, and Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus comes in like a rock star. All right, he marches in and he captures one major city. And then he continues on and captures another. And then he marches through the territory, just defeating every Celtiberian coalition he comes in contact with. After capturing several of these hill forts and and, and, and this region is populated by these fortified towns on top of hills, right? And these are common across most of, I guess you could say, the, the, the Celtic, quote-unquote Celtic lands, right? You see these fortified, or these, you know, you see these hill forts scattered throughout Europe. And they were common in Celtiberia. Just like, uh, you know, the Battle of Elysia. Elysia was another one of these fortified hilltop towns. And these were kind of difficult for the Romans to take, but Tiberius Gracchus, 
right? Nothing can stand in Tiberius Gracchus's way. And, you know, there are some tribes who actually end up surrendering and, uh, you know, some who are sort of frightened into submission by the speed and <laughs> decisiveness at which the Romans defeat their enemies. And eventually it all comes to a head and there's one more big decisive battle in which the Celtiberians lose like another 22,000 men. Right, and at this point the losses have been so grave that the Celtiberian people just can't continue to fight. Now, but the, the interesting thing is that during the course of the war, Tiberius Gracchus was playing a political game on top of the military one. There were cases where he took noble hostages from the cities that he defeated, and he made political treaties with different tribes in the reason, in the region. Like I said before, the, uh, the area was populated by these little petty kingdoms, right? And, and, you know, small territories in which culturally distinct tribes lived. And they lived in their own individual ways, right? They all shared sort of like a broad common culture. But there was no, there was no king of Celtiberia, right? There were just many tribes who lived in the area who were part of a broad coalition, right? And sometimes these tribes fought each other. Sometimes they fought with the Romans. You know, sometimes they surrendered. Sometimes they decided to stay out of the fighting, and sometimes they rose in rebellion. And as Tiberius Gracchus is marching through the area and he's winning all these battles, he's also taking noble hostages. He's making political agreements. And at the end of the war, even though Rome has stood victorious, instead of, you know, increasing the pressure of the proverbial boot, Tiberius Gracchus decides to impose a standard grain tax on the region, right? And what this did it was, is that it freed the people who lived there from the predations of the Carpatani, the equestrians I mentioned who were coming to collect taxes. And that, that's always, I've always found that to be an interesting move, right? Because Gracchus took the time to make these political, you know, and he, he also sort of made political friendships with, you know, with nobility in the area with what you would anyway consider to be the nobility of Celtiberia. He made the effort, I think, to sort of Romanize the area. He wanted to bring the provinces not only under Roman military control, but he wanted to bring them into the fold. And this really, uh, to me, it speaks of sort of a, uh, a political vision for the future. You know, he had some foresight. He was trying to make treaties that kept peace in the region. And he did that. He signed treaties that resulted in about 20 or 25 years of peace in Celtiberia. Now, one of the major, another major uh, part of the treaty, other than the standardized grain tax, was that the Celtiberians could fortify existing towns, but they could not found new ones. And that's because those hilltop forts were really hard for the Romans to take, right? Why allow your <laughs> conquered, you know, uh, people to build fortifications against your occupation? And so these terms were agreed to. Of course, the Celtiberians by this point had lost too many people to do anything but agree. And given the brutal nature of the ancient world, you know, I would venture to say that Gracchus, in this case, you know, he, he was doing a, you know, he certainly, ha he certainly had his own motivations for, for doing what he did. But he didn't have 
to make all these agreements with the Celtiberians. He could have just marched across the region, burning everything to the ground and taking everything. And, you know, went back to Rome and set up a tribute and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, he took the time to try to stabilize things in the region. And he could have been doing that for his own personal glory. He could have been doing it for the glory and benefit of Rome. He could have been doing it to please the gods, you know, or he could have been doing it because maybe he saw something in the Celtiberians. Who knows? Now, Gracchus's treaty is going to be a pivotal part in the next part of the story, right? And that provision that I mentioned about the Celtiberians, Celtiberians being unable to found new towns but able to fortify existing ones is going to be a major factor in the next outbreak of hostilities. In 154 BC, and this is about about nine or ten years after the fall of Carthage. Right. So this is just after Rome has won the Third Punic War. Hostilities erupt again in Celtiberia. A town called Sagata uh, begins to build a wall. And this is an existing town. And they have invited some other people to move to the city and they've kind of forced another tribe to participate. And so they're building this big, like, seven-kilometer-long wall. And the Romans don't like this, right? Because remember that those hilltop forts, those are, you know, tough for the Romans to to take. And so the Romans see this as kind of an act of, you know, aggression. And so they demand that the, um, you know, that they cease building this wall and they, they want a uh, tribute from, you know, this other tribe and they, you know, basically start trying to impose more terms. And the, the, the Celtiberian tribes involved in this, who I believe were called the, the, uh, the belly and, and I can't remember the, the name of the second but they replied that they had been released from the tribute and that Gracchus's treaty stipulated that they were allowed to fortify existing towns but weren't allowed to found new ones. And that was true. That was part of the treaty. But the Senate came back and said basically that it was always understood that those terms would continue under Rome's pleasure. And so that, that's just basically saying... Screw you. Do what we say. And so, of course, this didn't sit well with the people. They did not stop building the wall, and so the Romans prepared for war. And again, this is about 20 years or so, 25 years maybe after Gracchus's treaty. And so you've got a whole new crop you know, uh, of young people who have aged up to, to a suitable fighting age. You've probably got, you know, sons who remember the deaths of their fathers. You, you've got a whole generation of people who have suffered under the effects of the previous war. And so, in, in some respects, it, it, it may have been a tinderbox, you know, just waiting to go off. And so the, you know, Rome decides to send in a man who's going to have a series of missteps along the way. Quintus Fulvius Nobilior arrives in Hispania the next year, 
with a force of 30,000 men, right? And he's got a varied, you know, army. He's got some cavalry, and he's got these war elephants from Masinissa, who is an African king who is allied with Rome. And so Nobilior arrives and marches towards Segeda, which has not completed its wall, right? And so the people there, since the wall isn't complete, they all flee ahead of the legion, and they take refuge with a tribe called the Aravaki. <clears throat> the Aravaki welcome them, and they decide to fight, and they elect a man named Karas, who is a Segedan, as their commander. And so they all pr- get ready, and they prepare an ambush for the Romans, in the forest, right? And this is sort of an early precursor to, uh, you know, the future lost legions of Varus, maybe. You can imagine, uh, you know, tribes, people arrayed in the trees on either side of a trail and the Roman army marching through and then, you know, the, the, the Celts just falling upon them from both sides. In the ensuing chaos, 6,000 Romans are killed. And while pursuing the Roman baggage train, since the Romans are put to flight, the commander of the Celtiberians, Carus, the Sagaden, is killed, which is a kind of, uh, you know, a misstep for the Celtiberians. But nonetheless, this battle was devastating for the Romans. Now, the Aravaki, after their victory, they withdraw to the town of Numantia, which is going to become pivotal in this entire conflict because it's one of the more powerful towns in the area. Right, And after this Roman defeat, Nobilior is able to rally his troops, and a few days later they camp outside the city and prepare for battle. And so by this time, the Celtiberians had regrouped, they'd elected new commanders, and they had readied themselves for war. And so they go out to meet the Romans. Everybody gets arrayed up for battle, and, and Nobilior, all right, he's got these war elephants, remember, from Massinissa. And he puts the war elephants in the back of the formation, so they're kind of hidden from the enemy, right? And he splits the army... And at some point, while they, everyone is, you know, lining up to fight, he uh, maneuvers such that the elephants are revealed to the enemy. And this, you know, th- this obviously it scares the living shit out of the Celtiberians who, according to the texts, you know, anyway, ha- hadn't seen these creatures before. And so they all flee inside the walls of Numantia, Nobilior attacks the walls and this fierce battle ensues, right? And during the fighting, Nobilior is employing his war elephants and some, you know, Aravaki defender drops a boulder onto the head of one of the war elephants. And according to the text, the, the elephant kind of screams and starts going crazy and in its frenzy, it causes... You know, a few more elephants to start rampaging, and the next thing you know, it's chaos through the Roman lines. The elephants rampage and kill a bunch of the Roman soldiers, and the Romans are again put to flight for the second time. And as they're fleeing, the Aravaki sortie out of the walls, and they're able to kill a few thousand more Romans as they're running away. And as you can imagine, this defeat is staggering to the Romans. Because at the time, you know, the Romans were just coming off their victory over Carthage. Over the world power in the Mediterranean. You know, they just defeated this colossus enemy. And now, these Celts are (laughs) giving them a right spanking, you know, across the countryside. And so... Nobilior then tries to attack another town. I think it was called Axinium. 
that house the enemy uh, supplies, but he's not able to gain any ground. And he seeks some allies in the region, so he sends his uh, one of his cavalry commander out to treaty with another tribe that's nearby uh, for some cavalry assistance. And the apparently the commander is not able to really negotiate anything favorable. And he's given a few horsemen, but on the way back, an ambush is prepared for him, and the Roman commander is slain along with a bunch of his troops. <laughs> and so Nobilior is again defeated, and he has to retreat back to his camp. And the, the, this series of defeats is, is you know, <laughs> the news of these defeats is, is like traveling through the region, and it's just shocking the people who have been under the Roman boot for so long. Right, and you can imagine that many of these tribes are probably just itching for the opportunity to take up arms and rebel, right? To gain their own sovereignty back from those who would take it. And so, as this news is traveling through the region, it causes the town which had housed the Roman supplies to defect to the Celtiberian side, to join the rebellion. And so Nobilior is denied his winter food supplies, and he's forced to make winter camp in Hispania with no food supplies, no winter gear, and many more of his troops perish from cold and starvation. And by this time, you know, this is the first year of the campaign, and it is in shambles. And you can just imagine the Senate's fear at, at what's happening, you know, the anger that must be happening in, in, in the forum, the shouting and the yelling, you can just picture it, you know. So the following year, the Senate sends somebody new, which was common practice when, you know, uh, consular elections came around, command of the army always passed to the next man in line. But sometimes when a commander really screwed the pooch, so to speak, the Senate would replace them with someone new, and that is what's going to happen here. The next year, a man named Marcus Claudius Marcellus arrives in Hispania to, you know, bring the war to the preferred conclusion as far as the Senate is concerned. And according to some of the texts, you know, Marcellus is a political creature, and that's the way it is in Rome a lot of the times, is that, you know, the generals of the armies are also the politicians, right? They're the uh, sons of these noble families, these optimate families, right? They've got all the storied history and on and on and on. And so a lot of these people are looking for personal glory at all times. It's like a, a, a Roman characteristic. And, and it would have been expected of any, you know, Roman noble youth to seek personal glory and to bring glory to the name and to bring glory to Rome. It was you know, their driving ambition. So, Marcellus is a politician, and, and he comes into Hispania with reinforcements, and he moves on the town that had housed the Roman supplies. And the people there, they prepare an ambush for him, but he's able to kind of avoid it. He makes it to the town, and he's able to seize it. But rather than turning to slaughter and burning everything to the ground, uh, Marcellus imposes a fine and he grants the town a pardon. Now his leniency is, you know, surprising to a lot of people. And he, he starts to, you know, he starts the process of hammering out a new treaty. You know, maybe he sees himself as sort of like a, you know, a successor to... Tiberius Gracchus the Elder, you know. And uh, there's a lot of confusing things that happen there. You know, hit, hit a few tribes who are unaware of the peace treaty. They attack him, and he attacks them back. And then eventually it comes to a place where 
Marcellus is able to gather two factions, right? He is wanting to write a treaty that imposes a peace on the on the region, right? And he has a faction of tribal leaders who are asking him for leniency and they want him to return to the treaty of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. And they, were, they say they're willing to live by those terms. But there's another faction of Celtiberians who are angered by this. They want to keep fighting. So Marcellus gathers representatives from both factions and along with some of his officers and he writes letters to the Senate urging them to vote for peace and he sends them all to Rome. Okay. And everybody agrees to stop hostilities for a while and so this meeting takes place in the Senate. And the Senate hears both factions. And this is one of those times when the Roman ambition, you know, the complicated web that is Roman politics, it it really kind of rears its head because there are those in the Senate who think that Marcellus is just ambitious and they want to do everything they can to check his ambition. Because in the Roman mind, you know, in the Roman mind, glory is like a zero-sum game. You know, everything is a finite resource. If somebody else is in favor you know with Rome then that comes right out of you know there, there's only so much favor to be had basically and so everybody's trying to snipe each other and backstab and you know do everything they can to gain their own glory and these other senators they don't want to let Marcellus have the credit of pacifying Hispania and also they feel like the faction who was opposed to Rome was a little bit haughty. They didn't admit that they were defeated and they felt like they'd fought better than the Romans and this really offended the Roman sense of pride. And so the Senate gives these representatives a reply that's something like, Marcellus will tell you our answer and sends them all back. And so, as you might expect, this does very little to cease hostilities in the region. And it actually does more to kind of muddy the political waters in Rome and convince some of the senators there that Marcellus is only out for himself. And talks begin about replacing him, right? And a young Scipio Emilianus, he kind of stands up and asks the Senate to be allowed to, you know, raise an army and go himself, and he sort of excoriates the people who don't want to go to Hispania and fight, and it's kind of like, you know, this this is written about like it's a shocking event, like, you know, this young, <laughs> you know, fiery, you know, noble stands up and says, send me to Rome and I'll take, or send me to Hispania and I'll take care of it, and the Senate agrees, and this is like a first in Roman history because the you know uh, the people were chosen this different way because there was a lot of complaining about what was going on in the consular armies and of course the failures of Nobilior were probably kind of embarrassing to Romans so uh, they're still learning how to deal with these upstart regions and so things are going to kind of come to a head when Marcellus learns that they're sending another army so he he tries to shore up the end of the war before the next consul arrives at the head of his own army and that man's name is Lucullus but Marcellus is kind of unable to secure the bag he he secures a peace but that is going to be ignored by Lucullus who is coming at the head of his army probably with the intention of enriching himself. Because just like I said, every Roman politician is ambitious. And Lucullus wanted wealth and glory. He probably wanted a tribute. He wanted to enrich his name. He wasn't going to let Marcellus end the war in Hispania. Oh no. Oh no, not after he'd 
gone through the trouble of coming all the way there with an army that's just itching for conflict. Well, thanks for coming with me today on this little journey through the beginnings of the Celtiberian Wars. On the next episode, we'll continue the story. We'll talk about Lucullus. We'll talk about the rise of a hero to the Celtiberians, and one that maybe you haven't heard of. If you enjoyed the show, please like, follow, subscribe, all those wonderful things. Leave us a review. We'd love that. And if you're feeling squirrely, if you like dark stories, and in particular, if you like fantasy novels, you can go to my website, that's dwhawkins.com, and there you'll find a join tab where you can join my mailing list, and I'll send you two free fantasy books, as well as lots of other dark stories from history that I know you'll love. So we'll see you guys next time on Courage and Conflict. <laughs>